This is QTV News. I am Mamudu Gajaga and thanks for joining us. First, the main local business and international news headlines. In the local news, today marks World Cancer Day and we hear some facts and figures about the world's second deadliest disease. Eight members of the three years Jatna appeared at the High Court on Tuesday to request bail. The Alcala of Kerenmod Ali village, Sheikh Alin Sek, testifies before the TRRC, saying Sering Digal formed his own religion. In business news, plane maker Airbus is hit with a record fine. In international news, Malawi top court nullifies the 2019 presidential elections. We find out what happens next. Kenya's former president Daniel Arab Moy has died. We look back on his life and legacy. Welcome and thanks for joining us. This is QTV News. Now to the local news. Today is World Cancer Day. February 4th every year is the day set aside to raise awareness of cancer. The theme for this year, I am and I will, remind individuals and governments of their commitments in the fight to reduce cancer. Bintu Koka has more details. First identified by the father of medicine, Hippocrates, a Greek physician, Cancer is a disease which occurs when changes in a group of normal cells within the body lead to uncontrolled, abnormal growth, forming a lump called a tumor, the exception of this being leukemia. According to research, 9.6 million people die from cancer every year, making it the second deadliest disease, with only heart disease being more deadly. The theme for this year's World Cancer Day, I am and I will seeks to raise awareness about cancer and encourage people to prevent, detect and encourage governments and individuals across the world to take action against the disease, aiming to reduce the number of premature deaths by one-third of 2030. The United Nations Health Agency on Tuesday warned cancer cases could rise by 81% in low- and middle-income countries by 2040 because of lack of investment in prevention. The annual report found that overall cancer cases in the world would rise by 60% by 2040 and said tobacco use was responsible for 25% of cancer deaths. Age, alcohol, cancer-causing substances, chronic inflammation, diet, hormones, immunosuppression, infectious agents, obesity, radiation, sunlight and tobacco are suspected risk factors for cancer. Cancer can be treated depending on the type one gets, such as surgery with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, or hormone therapy. Research shows that a diet filled with a variety of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, and other plant foods helps lower risk for many cancers, as well as constant exercise even though there is no specific exercise which helps in fighting the disease. Bintu Koka, QTV News. The Defence Council of the accused three years Jatna members have demanded the High Court to grant bail to their clients. The eight accused appeared at the High Court on Tuesday. Mamudu Lamin Choi tells us more. The court case is now before the High Court Criminal Division which has jurisdiction to hear criminal offences that attract life sentence. It is now a case between the state and the eight accused persons after it was handed to the state prosecution team. The judge who had arguments between the state and the defense lawyers is Aminata Saho Sise. The lead defense counsel of the accused persons is Rachel Y. Mindy, who in her argument submitted that the state had not brought any proper charges before the court. Counsel Mindy also argued that the state intends to delay the trial of the accused by taking the matter to the lower courts, knowing that it was a wrong process. The defense team maintained that the charges leveled against the accused persons, which include an offense attracting life imprisonment, are bailable, emphasizing that they are Gambian citizens who have no intention of escaping justice. For the backing her claim, the defense lawyer references a previous ruling of the High Court and Supreme Court, citing that the courts granted bail to an accused who faced trial for offences which attracted life sentences. The state prosecution team denied all the claims by the lead defence counsel, 
citing relevant sections of the criminal procedure court countering the judicial precedents the defense team relied on for bail. Leading the state prosecution, lawyer Patrick Gomez urged the court not to grant bail to the accused persons, arguing that offenses which attract life sentence are not bailable. After rounds of submissions by both sides, Justice Aminata Saho Sisa adjourned the hearing until Thursday, the 6th of February, to make a ruling on the bail application. Outside the court premises are a handful of people who are out in solidarity with the accused persons under the watchful eyes of the police. Or shut into a minibus, the accused persons appear without remorse, while the agitated and angry crowd outside hailed the accused persons. <laughs> The Alcalo of Kermod Ali village, Sheikh Alin Sek, on Tuesday told the TRRC that Serin Digal formed his own religion when he instructed his followers to stop praying and focus more on zikr. Babu Kersi was there and has the rest of the details. The Alcalo of Kermod Ali village, Sheikh Alin Sek, told the commission that he was appointed the Alcalo of the village in 2009. He said Serin Digal is not a Muslim because the Marabu and his followers refuse to follow the pillars of Islam. He said Ndigal asked his followers to stop praying and not to go to Mecca for pilgrimage. The Alcalo added that Ndigal and his followers fast during Ramadan but break their fast before sunset. Marabu Ndigal, he said, told his people that he received revelations from God. He said the Ndigal followers were asked to follow the Hakikatul Munawar sect, which is not Islamic. At the Marabu's orders, his followers stopped praying in the normal Muslim way for seven years. The Alcalo said because of these reasons, they had a meeting with government officials to discuss ways to persuade Ndigal from what he is practicing and reopen the mosque that he closed. Sheikh Alun Sek says that Serin Ndigal refused to change his mind even after he was arrested by state authorities. Sheikh Alun Sek agreed that his name was mentioned at the court when Ndigal was arrested but the Alcalo said he did not appear in court. He also refutes claims that residents of the village were asked to shift allegiance to another leader. Thank you, Mahoma. I did not witness that. You did not witness it, but you've heard of it. No, I did not hear it. In fact, it did not happen. But to move on further, you did witness the paramilitary and the police beating up and arresting the followers of Ndigal. Well, the, the, the paras were attacked by Ndigal, and the paras will not just sit down and fold their hands when they are being attacked. He told the commission that he is not prepared to reconcile with the followers of Serin Ndigal and also not in a position to allow Ndigal's followers back to the village even though the High Court ruled otherwise. At that point, the lead council, Esafal, reminded the Alcalo that he and other villagers must at any cost not take the law in their own hands, as no one is above the law. Babu Karsi, QTV News. A delegation of heads of satellite institutions under the Ministry of Tourism and Culture is on a study tour to assess the current state of tourism attraction facilities in rural Gambia. Alusisa is travelling with the delegation and he now files in this report. The tour, which began on Monday and the first of its kind since 2017, is headed by Hamad Nkeba, the Minister of Tourism and Culture. The nationwide tour will avail the delegation the opportunity to assess and have a first-hand information about the current state of tourist attraction facilities in rural Gambia. Tourism is a key contributor to the country's GDP and a big employer. Day one of the tour took the minister and entourage to Fort Blen, a UNESCO protected heritage site in Barra, where efforts are underway to give a first lift to the facility. However, Minister Bao was not in support of the idea of plastering the wall with cement, which will erode the originality of the site. This thing has to be restored to originality. It is affecting the integrity of the site. You understand? Because it is not part of it. So it needs to be removed. We need to hire an expert to give it back to what it was before. It must be restored to its originality as you do the other one you have. I think this should be avoided seriously. 
because since UNESCO is complaining, we should do what it takes to make sure we do what needs to be done. And you need to invite experts to do that. Uh, every effort must take Madam Permanent Secretary and Director General. Let's make sure that this thing, we take it up and look for uh, support, particularly the American Embassy. I think they can help us. Since they are doing the sea defense, we should also work on getting an expert internationally to come help restore this thing to its originality. What used to be one of the most visited historical sites by tourists is now mostly visited by students. An erudite historian and director general of National Center for Arts and Culture, Hassam Sise, explains the historical background of Fort Bulen. It was the only fort along the West African coast, which was specifically you know, constructed, uh, this one in 1830, to you know, stop the slave trade. But all the other forts, like James Island, like the forts in Gore, and so on, you know, they helped perpetuate the trade. But this fort was built so as to control the illegal, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, shipping of slaves from the River Gambe area. Despite its importance, the site has suffered major setback as a result of illegal activities that were said to have been taking place at the site. Um, about 15 years ago, it was occupied for two years. Uh, you know, I mean, and then, I mean, I mean, it became like a no-go area, you see, you know, which really affected the fort. One, you know, they tampered with the integrity. For example, you know, the stone masonry, for which it was recognized by UNESCO, you know, was covered like in cement, yeah, as you can see. Uh, number two, I mean, I mean, they did, you know, some diggings, uh, you know, I mean, they were digging like dungeons or like torture chambers, uh, you know, and that also, you know, helped to weaken. Uh, you know some aspect you know of the uh, you know of the fort uh, you know so those are two challenges you know, but since then we have you know worked with the british high commission to establish a site museum and also we have bought electricity because we also want to encourage the people of bara um to use it to host you know their annual festival fort blend is an important place for the planned international cultural festival in december this year earlier on the delegation paid a courtesy call to the chief of lower nyomi fabaka nana sonko where several speakers acknowledge the importance of tourism in the area. Fort Bullen is on the beach at the estuary of River Gambia and the Atlantic Ozone in the northwest of Barra Town in the lower Nyome district of North Bank region. It was built by the British in 1826 with the specific aim of preventing the trade in slaves after the passing of the Abolition Act of 1807, making the slave trade illegal in the British Empire. In the early 1970s, it was declared a national monument and in 2003, along with the six-gun battery in Banjul, was inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Reporting for QTV News, I am Aliou Sise. The Gambia Immigration Department in 2019 announced at a press conference on Friday that it had generated $139 million in revenue. Immigration authorities also confirmed the introduction of a new residency permit for non-Gambians, a move also expected to raise revenue. The press briefing was held to inform the public about the new residence permit scheme and all the initiatives to standardize the entry and exit of people in the Gambia. Um, the um, residence permit A, that is, you know, um, 1,850. Residence permit B for ECOWAS, 1,850. And um, residence permit B for non ECOWAS, 3,100. Non alien card 1,600 and non Gambian ID card 650. The immigration officials say the new residence permit is accessible nationwide, like the National Identification Card Scheme. Oli Matu Jame, Commissioner of Processing, tells us more. The issuance of biometric uh, residence permits, ID card, and non Gambian ID cards has also been rolled out in all the issuing centers during the first week of Feb uh, January 2020, except in Barra, where we do not have physical structures of the ID card issuing center. They are still on a mobile team. But plans are on the way, of course, to ensure that it is also rolled out in Barra, to ensure that the non-Gambians and foreigners that are in Barra are also issued with this uh, biometric ID card to avoid or ease them from having to come all the way from Barra to Banjul. 
With the issuance of ID cards, the immigration officials say 138,764 ID cards were issued in 2019, whilst 137 applications were rejected. Assistant Commissioner of Research and Planning Ibrahim Amane outlined the Gambia Immigration Department's achievements in the past year, adding that empowering women will be among their targets in 2020. We are talking about the equal participation of ladies in our institution like men's. We want them to occupy position at command level, strategic and operational level, like that we men's are handling. We also want to uplift their confidence level, you know, to be able to approach and do things in a manner that we men's are doing. And we've also felt that they have been lacking behind for a very, very long time. Superintendent Carol Angjaju, officer in charge of the Revenue and Logistics Unit, updated the gathering on revenue collected in 2019. But when you come to 2019, uh, we were able to secure 99,422,200 in this 99 million. Uh, to make the easy comparison, we have to extract the ID card and the biometric passport out of it. So when we include all the biometric passport and, and uh, biometric passport and ID card on to 99 million, then we were able to be able to score this 139 million and six hundred seventy two thousand eight hundred and forty. This is our revenue performance. Officials of the Gambia Immigration Department urge all Gambians to apply for ID cards and order relevant documents and non-citizens are advised to get their resident permit. Reporting for QTV News, I am Jenna Basonko. The British High Commissioner, accompanied by Rotarians and side box officials, Monday visited the organization of the visually impaired Govi Secretariat in Kanifing. QTV's Ansumana Esunyasi covered the delegation's visit and he now reports. The visit presented the High Commissioner, Sidebox officials and their Rotarian partners an opportunity to assess the impact of the various projects and activities supported by Sidebox at the Govi School for Visually Impaired Children. Speaking to the students, the British High Commissioner, Sharon Waddle, expressed her delight with the work that Sidebox has been doing at the school, which she says has a huge impact on the children's academic performance. However, she calls for the legislation of bills that will protect and promote the rights of persons with disability. And we're continually encouraging uh, government and others to ensure that you have a Disability Act because that will make sure that your rights and your interests are considered and remembered and respected, both during your school days but also as you go out into employment. Addressing the delegation, Amira Jang, lifetime president of the Gambia Organization for the Visually Impaired, says Sidebox has been supporting Govi in raising awareness on prevention of blindness and the need for inclusiveness. However, she says the school is still faced with many challenges. The provisions of learning materials, they are in dear need of these things because uh, without these materials, they cannot work effectively and they have to be abreast with, with uh, the modern world. So they need these learning materials to empower them. And also the other challenges are the social discriminations that the blind people encounter in society. Angela Williams is the Sidebox Global Ambassador. She says her organization is a charity of vision providing hope for visually impaired children in the Gambia and beyond. While applauding the resource of Sidebox intervention at Govi, she adds that they are working closely with Rotarians in the UK who continue to support their drive to provide eyeglasses for students at the Govi School. I can certainly see a huge difference in the confidence of the students at Govi. We've even put a memorandum of understanding together and signed to show our true commitment. The mass results for this school have improved so much through Sightbox having had been introduced here. So please, can I ask that we all make sure that Sightbox continues to grow and develop, not only in the Gambia, but connecting the world and changing the lives for the visually impaired. The Gambia Organization for the Visually Impaired was established in 1991 and has been at the forefront of supporting persons with sight loss. Govi officials say partnering with a charity like Sightbox, whose mission is to tackle the segregation of visually impaired children 
in developing countries is changing many lives. Hansman is on Nyasi for KTV News. We'll take a short commercial break and join us after the break for more international news and sports. QCell is at it again with its brand new free mobile app. Oh yes, now you can access the wonderful world of QCell with the new app and get all your favorite services on the app. There's no need to remember any codes. Fantastic, no more codes. And even better, with the new app, you can live stream QTV and listen to Q Radio on your phone, anywhere, anytime. Yes, listen to Q Radio Live, purchase your Q Power tokens, use your Q Money wallet, and do much more all for free on the app. Go now and download the app for free from Play Store or the App Store. And you can get 30 days free QTV streaming once you download the app. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that's because it's QCell, the network you trust for great things. QCell, a decade of innovation. A lifetime of trust. Welcome back and thanks for joining us. This is QTV News. Now to business news. Europe's biggest aerospace multinational Airbus has been hit with a record fine after it was found that the company bribed public officials to land contracts in at least 20 countries. The plane maker, which is also a major defense and space supplier, has agreed to pay a record $4 billion after reaching settlements with investigators in Britain France and the United States to end a probe that began four years ago. French and British authorities have been investigating Airbus for alleged corruption over jet sales for more than a decade, while the US has probed the plane maker over suspected violations of US export controls. US District Judge Thomas Hogan is handing down judgment in the US court, said it was a pervasive and pernicious bribe scheme in various divisions of Airbus that went for a number of years. The fine is one of the biggest against a corporate entity. And now to international news. Malawi's Constitutional Court has passed a ruling overturning the 2019 presidential vote. The judgment followed a petition filed by the opposition who argued that the vote was rigged following the election in May 2019. Incumbent President Peter Mutarika had been declared the winner. However, in overturning the election result, the court found that there had been numerous irregularities, including instances where more people voted than were registered and where preliminary results had been tipexed and changed. The court ordered a new election to be held within 150 days. <laughs> Ex-Kenyan President Daniel Arab Moy dies. Daniel Arab Moy, Kenya's second post-independent president, has died. Unfortunately for him, he took over from Jomo Kenyatta. The rule of Kenya's second president, Daniel Arab Moy, was marked by a deepening of corruption and nepotism. Moy, who came from a simple pastoral roots and ruled for decades, died on Tuesday at the age of 95. <laughs> And now to the world of sports, and here to give you that is Ansumana Esonyasi. Ansumana, what's happening in the world of sports? Well, thank you very much, um, Gajaga. I mean, as it is World Cancer Day, I mean, we look at cancer and sports. Now, a cancer diagnosis often no longer means an automatic death sentence. Well, that is the belief of Professor Wilhelm Bloch of the German, I mean, Sport University in Cologne. Um, Professor Bloch believes that first, there is the preventive factor. Someone who engages in sports is already doing something that will help reduce the risk of getting cancer. On the other hand, though, um, sports also helps patients 
to recover from cancer. Now, currently, the focus is on using sports to enhance the effect of the principal therapy. Um, sports doesn't cure cancer, of course, as we all know, but it does enable the body to cope with the cancer or it improves, I mean, the therapy. So, in commemoration of the day, we take a look at some of the top sports stars who defied cancer. And at number one is Mario Lemex, ice hockey player who was diagnosed and returned to play at the highest level. At number two is Edna Campbell, basketball legend who was also diagnosed and also returned to playing at the very highest level. At number three is Novlin Williams Mills, Jamaican sprinter, silver med medal winner with Jamaica's relay team, who also, I mean, successfully fought cancer and returned to her sport. At number four is Max Taylor, 18 year old footballer with Manchester United. After his diagnosis, he is in line to play for the senior team. And at number five is Lance Armstrong, cyclist, who in 1996, then 25-year-old U.S. road race cyclist Lance Armstrong was diagnosed with testicular cancer, which had also spread to his brain, lungs, and abdomen. Well, his doctors gave him little chance of survival, but he went on to win the Tour de France a record seven straight times. Quite remarkable. And here we bring you his very famous interview with Oprah Winfrey. In all seven of your Tour de France victories, did you ever take banned substances or blood dope? Yes. In your opinion, was it humanly possible to win the Tour de France without doping? Seven times in a row. Not in my opinion. And I'm afraid that's all we have for you for sports today. Thank you very much, Antumana Sunyasi, for that sports update. Um, sports and cancer, it can at least give you some positive image and thinking. Before we end this bulletin of the news, let's take a quick look at our main news stories. In the local news, today is World Cancer Day, and we had some facts and figures about the world's second deadliest disease. Eight members of the three years Jotna appeared at the High Court on Tuesday to request bail. The Alcalo of Kermod Ali village, Sek Alim Sek, testifies before the TRRC, saying Sering Digal formed his own religion. In business news, plane maker Airbus is hit with a record fine. In international news, Malawi top court nullifies the 2019 presidential elections. We find out what had happened next. Kenya's former president, Daniel Arab Moid, has died. We look back on his life and legacy. That's all we have for you in this news edition. Join us tomorrow for more news.